you know, what you use here is what they're going to eat over there. More often than not, it's all about the presentation, not the fly. Like I always say to people, make sure you have the presentation right, because if the presentation's right, they'll eat it. You could have the world's best fly and the wrong presentation and it won't work. But if you have the right presentation and a marginal fly, it will. So that's actually better. So yeah, focus on the presentation and getting it in front of them and finding the fish rather than the pattern. That was Tom Jarman with a solid reminder about the importance of presentation for trout. We've got a co-host for this one today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you can, make sure to hit the subscribe button in your app of choice. If you're new uh, to the podcast, this will make sure that the next episode gets uh, sent directly to you and you get a reminder. So that's probably the easiest way um, uh, to do it. Although Apple, I think right now is changing some of their subscribe, follow uh, sorts of things. But uh, if you're not on Apple, just click subscribe. Tom Jarman, one of the leaders out of Australia in the Euro game, is here uh, with Zach Vandehe to help me co-host the show today. We find out about the four uh, main Euro strategies that Tom focuses on, why lock style fishing is actually simpler than it may sound, and the bucket list spot for all three of us today. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly to get started right now. TurtleBox is a new company I've been working with this year. Unlike most other portable speakers out there, the TurtleBox was specifically built with a sportsman in mind. The quality of this speaker is truly unreal. I've talked with the guys at Turtle Box, saw dudes by the way. They love the outdoors and are all avid sportsmen. This is a product I can truly say does not disappoint. Go ahead and check the guys out at turtleboxaudio.com. Without further ado, here is Tom Jarman from tomjarmanflyfishing.com. Like late 90s, early 2000s, where you effectively had all these teams trying to achieve the same thing. Uh, which was trying to get flies deep in fast water without being tethered to the surface film. So um, that really started with like Czech nymphing, French nymphing, Spanish nymphing and Polish nymphing, which have now all blended together and have become what we now know as European nymphing. But so I, I really came into it. I've been competition fishing here in Australia for 11 years. Um, so I really came into it when French nymphing was really big. So long leader French nymphing where there was no fly line. Um, long leaders upstream Um, and effectively it's kind of since then it's blended so much to the point when you know everyone's using almost no matter where you are in the world whether you're fishing in the UK you're fishing continental Europe North America South Africa Australia everyone's pretty much on the same leader construction same leader setup Um, which is yeah very like the old Spanish nymphing leaders Um, but effectively all the you know the key factors of all the different techniques have now kind of converged together. And I was, uh, and I, you just reminded me, I, I've had a couple of guests on, you probably know, I'm sure Devin Olson and um, a couple of the other guys over here, uh, they, they broke down a little bit of the history on that. And some of this pretty entertaining, you know, um, we haven't talked a lot about Australia. How do you guys, you know, differ in, you know, how you do it uh, compared to say some of the other folks? I mean, is it all, are you guys all working together? I mean, you said you're using the same stuff. Is it pretty much all similar these days? Yeah, look, it's 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 pretty similar. I mean, we've uh, I guess one of the things is now that all the teams, like you mentioned, those guys, and I know Devin very well, um, caught up with him when he was in Australia last year, and people like that, like we're all, you know, com- it's competitive fishing, but everyone's really friendly and gets along so well and share. So all the information's out there across all the country, so everyone's almost doing the same thing. Like I use the same leader material. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. And. And Zach, I was going to ask you, you know, you, I think, know a little bit of, of Tom's background. I mean, what specifically, because I've had guests or you're not guests, but I've had listeners come to me and we've had some episodes where I've done them and, and they've, some people have said, you know, they want to hear some more of the details. I mean, what do you think, you know, Zach, do you have anything specific, you know, when you think of what, you know, the stuff Tom Yeah, does? I mean, I mean, something that comes to mind for me is, Tom, you're talking about your kind of, your water types, right? And you guys, it seems like you have a lot of low volume stuff. And so you're able to fish a lot of 
lighter flies and things like that um, and get away with that and have it be really effective. Is there, do you have like a strategy for like when you're faced with like a new river or say you travel to another country or something like that and you're, you know, kind of on this plopped on this new set of water, what, what's your kind of thought process and or strategy for, you know, those situations? Um, yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, look, it's an interesting one. That kind of involves both urinymphing and not urinymphing. Um, I think I say it in quite a lot of my, my videos is that whenever I, I'm put on a new piece of water, um, well, actually, to jump back, Australia, to give you the context of the low water, because there's not much flow, the, waters, the our rivers are quite shallow, still fast flowing, but we don't have that volume of water. Um, our fish look up a lot. So there's a lot of dry fly fishing, um, and the fish right. are happy to the fish are happy to move. They're not necessarily locked down on the bottom, and they're comfortable sitting mm-hmm. particularly shallow. Um, that's one thing about our brown trout. And the other difference is the the amount of food in our rivers. Like I remember when I was over in Oregon doing the clinics, you roll a rock on um, right. you know, on the Deschutes or something, and there's just caddis and there's stuff all under them. Over here in Australia, right. you roll a rock over in the river, and you're looking, and there's like oh one mayfly there. You know, there's one caddis grub there, um, a stonefly, if you're lucky. So um, right. there's they, they naturally look up our fish over here, our brown trout. Um, but to break down a river, when I first get to it, my favorite technique is nymph below dry or dry dropper, um, mm-hmm. mainly because that f- for us over here, it gives you the chance to see if they're willing to come up. There's nothing worse than being beneath the fish and just people always love to nymph and they go straight into nymphing. Um, and you just never like it's a cardinal sin to be beneath the fish because ultimately trout have eyes on the top of their head and they look up so if you're beneath them that's never good and that's very like big in a lake situation as well but um, nymph below dry is really good because it gives you that each way bet and you're not going to catch as many on the nymph as you would if you were straight nymphing but at least you you can rule out the dry or rule out something and I more and more uh, these days I'm loving fishing nymph below dry on the urine nymphing setup so Mm-hmm. Um, you're effectively using the weight of the nymph to help propel your cast and then you're using um, you can fish quite long with it and then you're using your dry to anchor the cast throughout the drift so um, I really like going into rivers nymph below dry just to get a feel for it and you can cover water more quickly because your drifts are longer because you can cast longer so nymph below dry is really good for that and then you know you get a few eat the dry and you go okay look we're onto it here or you know if they're just not coming up to eat or they're eating the nymph and eating it badly, you think, look, my drifts are bad because I'm fishing nymph below dry. I need to dedicate it, you know, go to your own nymphing. Um, and then right. back in the – talking about Australia, I love a single nymph over here. Like I really like to fish a single nymph just because it's far more precise because our water is shallow. You don't need to really – like if you're on a big river, you feel a bit naked just with one fly. Even if you're fishing beneath the bobber sometimes, like over in America, you kind of want the two depths. Um, right. cause our waters are, are lower and they're not as deep as some other parts in the world. A single nymph's perfect. So yeah. Does that answer that roughly for you? Yeah. And, and is this, you know, you were talking about fishing, you know, a nymph below dry on, uh, like kind of a leader or a Euro setup. Um, do you, do you have, do you change your leader setup based on that kind of situation or do you just make it work, you know, same rod, same leader? Yeah, same same rod, same same urine nymphing leader. Um, I mean, we can put my. I think I have a video on YouTube explaining it, but we can put it in. I don't know if we can put a link into how it's set up, but effectively, it's a mm-hmm. urine nymphing braid core level line. Um, then I've just got straight 0.18 millimeter in diameter. So that's about three x, I think, or four x. Um, right. All the way, all the way through um, to where my indicator is, and then a tippet ring, and then my tippet. And you'll be amazed at how you can actually cast that. Like you can cast a single dry on just that straight setup as well. Um, so as soon as you add a little bit of weight, like a 2.5 millimeter bead or a 2.8 millimeter bead, you can actually right. you know, cast quite a fair distance. And you don't really want to fish a heavier nymph than that because otherwise it'll pull your dry under because you're not fishing a sacrificial dry like a chubby Chernobyl or something. You know, you're right. fishing like your parachute atoms or you're fishing – you know, like a, a deer hair sedge or um, a CDC sedge or a split wing or something. So, um, yeah, you don't actually need to change your setup. And that's why it's so good because you can jump onto the river. That's your setup. You do it. And then once you work out which way you go, you might go, okay, I'm just going to nymph. That's great. Chop the dry off and you keep fishing. Or if you go, I really need to fish a dry, you're probably going to want to change to a true dry fly setup. But I was, carrying two rods is a, 
is something I, I always do. So that makes that a lot easier. And so what are this, I mean, this makes me curious, like what are some situations in which, you know, you've kind of mentioned your own MFIN and, uh, you know, a dropper below a dry. What are some like typical scenarios over there or other places you've been where you switch just to a single dry? I mean, fishing sh- shallows, the, the easy one um, and pressured fish. Um, right. Like in a competition, like you can get a longer drift presenting a dry or an infalo dry mm-hmm. um, than with a urine infing setup. So that's one factor. If you have large amounts of water, you need to cover quickly to find the fish. But um, look, a single dry is really good over here because um, in competitions over here, and it's, it was the same in the, the world championships we had in Tassie, um, I think I actually followed uh, Pat Weiss from the American team and a guy mm-hmm. from the Czech team, uh, Vojta Unger and um, caught the same amount of fish as them, but in the fifth session after the four of them before, and I actually did it fishing a dry just because they get really sick of beads in pressured rivers. Right. So they're sick of seeing, you know, your silver bead, your copper bead, your pink bead, your gold bead. So they're still there and they still want to eat because they're opportunistic, but, you know, they're sick of that plop can be a bit too much for them sometimes. Um, and yeah, it allows you to also present the fly from further away. So if they are spooky, you can present a fly from distance um, compared to being on top of them. So yeah, there are there are a couple. And there's quite there's quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, like it's just natural over here to our fish just love a dry. So and it takes you know, when you have two rods, or it doesn't take long to make a few long drifts um, and then put the rod away and then go in with the nymph afterwards. And you can pretty much know for fish. Like if you catch fish on a dry and then fish through it with a nymph after and he doesn't eat, you don't get an extra one on a nymph. You can kind of go, well, I could probably just push through with a single dry here. Um, so, yeah, that's that's one of the scenarios. And are your fish, um, you know, it's, I think it's it's summer where you're at and it's, it's winter where we are currently. Um, do you find that the fish there are responsive um, year round to a dry fly? Is it kind of a universal thing or, or are there peak seasons? Um, well, so our fisheries close over winter. Um, so we, yeah. So in, on the mainland of Australia, our season closes at the end of uh, like the start of June. So June, July, August, our rivers are closed here on the mainland. And then in Tasmania, they're closed um, May, June, July. So you don't, re- yeah, we don't really have that <laughs> the data points there, but to work that out and kind of know. But they do. You see them in the off season when you're, you know, walking along the river. You, you go, oh, a fish rises there. <laughs> um, so it's it's general. They do. It's but it's purely based on flow, flow rates, water clarity. If it's low and clear over winter, they're rising and they're fine. So. Yeah, so early, first, like I remember I've had a few opening days, opening days of the season where I've just gone out and they've eaten a dry fly first day of the season when it's, uh, I know you guys go in um, Fahrenheit over there, but, you know, the air temperature might be 10 degrees um, Celsius. So I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but not warm and they still eat it. So, yeah. Right. 10 degrees, I think roughly, uh, what is that? I think that's like uh, 42 Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. roughly, just a guesstimate. Nice. Um, I, I was curious about, you know, we were talking about brown trout a little bit. Is there a big difference? Are you, are you talking about specifically here browns or is it, are these techniques work browns versus rainbows or, and that, those are the two main species you guys are focused on? Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have browns, rainbows, and there's like the tiniest, tiniest amount of brook trout, but there's only a handful of places where they're wild. Um, yeah, mainly talking, I mean, those techniques, absolutely. The, the mindset doesn't change much for those, um, for whether you're fishing at Browns and Rainbows, because you go to Tasmania and fish the Mersey River, which was in the World Championships, actually. And the rainbows in that river sit up in like half a foot of water on the edge and eat a dry, and they act like brown trout. It's really bizarre. So it does work for both of them. But um, generally, as a rule, our browns will sit shallower than our rainbows, um, and our rainbows will push more into the faster water. So, um, But, yeah. you know, depending there's a lot of variation in regions where there are just brown trout and there are just rainbows um, or more rainbows than browns, that sort of thing. So there is, there's a lot of overlap, but um, yeah, you could pretty much, you know, just approach it the same, whether they are browns or rainbows and you'll get a pretty good feel for it. 
Nice. And what was, you know, we, we could dig into a little bit of your stuff over there. I, I'm curious when you were in the States here, have you fished a lot of rivers or is there a couple that you might note uh, that you've, you've covered? You, yeah. yeah. So um, I fished, uh, so in America, I fished um, Colorado and, and Oregon mainly. Um, Colorado, I absolutely love the Eagle. That place is amazing. Um, uh, but I'd say probably the best and the most interesting rivers, the Deschutes and the Metolius, um, in Oregon. So yeah, they're just absolutely fantastic. Um, and just, just different. They're just, look, we don't have, we just don't, you look at the a river like Metolius one, um, they're green, the green drake hatches and the golden stones and stuff are amazing. Like, I don't think you'd find an insect on an Australian river that big. So I remember I had a green drake fly past me and I thought it was a bird or something. <laughs> um, you, just, you just never see it. Um, yeah. So that, that, that was awesome. really interesting. And steelhead. Steelhead are amazing. Um, oh, nice. So you got, you, got some steelhead, you got some steelhead in? I it, When I was in Oregon running the clinics at Jeff Heron's shop in uh, Sisters and then the Hazel's place at, um, on the Deschutes, yep. Deschutes mm-hmm. outfit is there. Um, I, yeah, they took, John took me, John Hazel took me for a week of steel heading there. So I managed nice. to, I oh, completely amazing. blew one chance on the swing and then I got uh, my first one on the last day actually. And it was like, there that was go. in, that was in early July. So really early in the oh, wow. season too. So I was very wow. lucky. Yeah, for sure. That is cool. Have you, uh, Zach, have you fished the, uh, Metolius much? I, I have fished the Metolius. Um, yeah. It's an interesting place. Uh, yeah. Really beautiful water. Um, yeah, it's super special. It has this like really amazing like summer camp vibe to it. It's, it's a special place for sure. The way it comes out of the ground as well, it just appears. Yeah, <laughs> it's mirac- like it's amazing. Um, right. Yeah, but you know the thing I found about that river was just how good nymphing was on it. Like it's known mm-hmm. as a, a dry fly water. Um, but and everyone fishes the holes waiting for the rise. But the fish there love sitting in the back eddies. Like they just sit in the eddies. And if you can, you know, if you have a urinimping set up or uh, one of the guys who worked at the fly fishers place who took me there, he kind of had like a quasi urinimping set up and we just adapted that. And he was literally able to just fish some heavy nymphs in those backwaters and really jig them and animate the fly and you'd get the fish to come up and eat them. So that was really cool. That's interesting. I, that's interesting you say that you guys were able to animate the flies and jig them. I've actually never heard of anybody uh, doing that on that river. It's kind of cool. Well, they're so, and you think about it, they're so used to it. Like a lot of people fish those like green drakey style emerger patterns and swing them. Like they almost fish spiders at them. It's no different, but like almost one of the early stages of like a green drake ascending to the surface. If you think, um, like I talk about in nymphing when I, when I teach it, it is effectively – you've got four core presentations. You've got a dead drift, you've got a jig, which is your animation. You have a swing, you let it swing out beneath you where it kind of sweeps up like an ascending insect. And then you've got the induce, which is often how you like to present to grayling, where you effectively stop your rod and your nymphs ascend and swing up, almost like a pendulum, like a grandfather clock. Um, Because if you stop your rod, the current keeps them coming and they sweep up towards the surface. And that really induced a lot of fish there just because it's like an emerging insect just ascending to the top. So, um, yeah, hmm. they're really good to apply there, I found. And amazing for the whitefish as well. Yeah, I find that ascending technique really super effective on the Deschutes as well. Um, a lot of those midday mayfly hatches, I find a lot of fish will take like that. Yeah, and, you know, one of the, one of, uh, the big reasons why, like, that ascending fly or the swing is really good for those fish is, um, as much as the presentation, one of the good things it does in fast water, it actually slows the fly down. If you're fishing a dead drift, the fly's moving at a reasonable pace in fast water and a fish sitting on the bottom is just seeing these things go over its head, go over its head, and they're like, oh, I can't be bothered to go there. But as soon as your fly starts to swing, it's actually dragging, so it slows down. So it almost gives that fish time to go, oh, it's still there, it's still there. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. So it actually slows up the presentation a lot for those fish. Um, and almost gets them over the edge to commit to it as well. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. TurtleBox is the loudest, truly portable, waterproof Bluetooth speaker available. Perfect for a skiff, drift boat, or your craft of choice. 
The guys at Turtle Box believe in respecting the peace and beauty while on the water, but listening to great tunes before or after can be amazing. I remember our last big river trip this summer, and it was cool to break out the Bluetooth speaker as we listened to some classic music and tried to play along with our guitars. Without a Bluetooth speaker, we would have missed a bunch of amazing opportunities and some good laughs. The features I love most on this one are the quality bulletproof frame, easy to push and lighted buttons, and uh, at home you can add another speaker for uh, stereo. To be honest, I've been using uh, this speaker quite a bit around the home and the dance party with the kids has been great. Find out why TurtleBox is our go-to speaker and why it is great for the river as well. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash TurtleBox to support a great company, this podcast, and some tunes. And uh, and let's keep uh, let's keep this podcast going strong and support a great company. Again, head over to wetflyswing.com slash TurtleBox to get started right now. I, and I didn't totally take in all, all the technique. The one is, so, so just remind again, so you had the... Um, what were the three you, you, you noted there? So uh, as far as your nymphing presentations? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, probably four you want to have in your arsenal. You've got the dead drift, um, and I was always taught that your first uh, presentation anywhere wants to be a dead drift because you have the tightest and the best connection to your flies. So you're most likely hooking the fish. After the dead drift, you can jig the fly, cast up, let it achieve depth, and effectively jig it, bounce it, um, the reason you want to do the dead drift first is because every time you jig it, as it's falling, you're out of contact with the fly. So a fish can eat it and get rid of it in that period. So you only do that after you've dead drifted a spot. Then thirdly is the swing. Cast up, let it drift down, swing, sweep out behind you. And then you've got your um, induce. So cast up, let the fly drift down, stop the rod. And what happens is the, the flies swing up like a pendulum or like a grandfather clock at the end of the presentation and kind of ascend That's to the right. top. Yeah. That's right. And, and then when you're, say, on the metolius, which is a good tip, so these fish are holding in kind of the pools, and, and what would, would be the technique to, to hit, hit them in the pools? Uh, you really you need heavy flies. You want to get your fly uh, down to them um, and ultimately get it down one of the hard parts about the pools on the metolius and big water is you get a lot of upwelling those people that have fished those styles of rivers would know in those backwaters there's a lot of upwelling and swirl so if you cast in there and just let your fly sink and hold it there the current can actually push your fly and buffet your fly around and put you out of contact with it so a fish can eat it and get rid of it and you don't know so one of the really good things about jigging your fly in that water it's one reason you often catch a lot more in that water fishing like a Euro technique than under a, like a thingamabobber is that fish in that backwater often are sitting midwater and they eat the fly. And if you think about the function of a, a fly, like how we detect a take, we need the current to push the line so that either our indicator goes under or the fish swims away so the indicator goes under or we feel it. But if a fish eats it and just sits there, nothing's going to happen. So by jigging the fly, often it does two things. You're literally jigging it and the fish goes, oh, it's moving, I'll eat it. And then as you jig it, you feel him and you strike. Or if often you'll cast in there, let your fly sink and you'll go to jig it and then you'll feel all this slack and go, oh, I can't even feel my fly. And you pull up a foot of line and then you go, oh, I'm tied to my fly. Or, oh, shit, one's already got it. So um, it does a few things. One of the biggest things is contact. Because, yeah, the current just pushes us in and out of contact continually uh, with our flies. Yes, those are amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a <laughs> huge tips for me. Uh, Zach, did you, were you familiar with all those four uh, when you're out there? Is that, is that kind of some new, new stuff for you? It was a, uh, it's a really concise way of putting it. You know, I think a lot of times you, you listen to things or you read different articles and you get pieces of that, you know, um, but it, it's, it's, it's nice to hear it put together with a bit of strategy as far as like approaching the water and kind of like when you would use the technique um, versus just like, Hey, here's one technique. You know what I mean? Like try it sometime and in you not really knowing like it's time or place. Um, yeah. And I, I've been, I've been to the Metolius and, and just sat on some of the, on the bank on some of those uh, back eddies and just watched the fish and you can see the upwelling where the fish will cycle around. You know, you'll see, that water so gin clear that you'll see, you know, however many fish at the very bottom. And then just certain fish will start when they start feeding, they'll just start cycling through in those different currents. I um, mean, they'll be at different depths and it's really, 
really i i find it really fascinating to just like sit there and observe it for it's you know yeah the amount the amount of time that you're there yeah and if we extrapolate on that point um so we're probably digressing a little but a really interesting thing you just raised there is that and it's one thing a lot of people don't think about when it comes to river fishing is that if you think about a river it's pretty i'd be happy to go out on a limb and say it's impossible to achieve the same drift twice with your flies because a river never flows the same two moments in time because all it takes is for one rock to roll over you know a kilometer upstream and that slightly moves the current and your fly will never actually track through the exact same position so it really puts it in perspective how long sometimes you need to make the presentation to get the fly to behave or to get it to where you want it to be because every single time you make a cast it's going to go somewhere different or it's going to behave slightly differently because the current's always different and you do see that when you sit on crystal clear rivers like the metolius and you look in and you think well there's a fish sitting even in the main runs in the main current you're like he's there and then a second later he's gone and if you happen to make a cast if you're fishing up blind and you happen to make a cast when he wasn't there, you would keep fishing through and keep moving up and go, well, there were no fish there, but you just happened to make the presentation at the moment that the fish was like two foot to the side or something. So, yeah, it's, and that's why I always, people often worry about fishing behind people or fishing after people, but it should never really worry us because like they just move around and do so many different things like that just because of the way the current behaves. And we, we all see it when you have um, a function of uh you see a fish rise and he goes rise 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 off the top and then he stops rising for a minute and you go where's he gone and then suddenly he's back that exact same thing is happening when you're you're urinimping or when you're nymphing a river on the bottom but we just can't see it so it's very hard for us to comprehend that and if you fish past him in that period when the equivalent fish which was we went we just watched which went rise 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 and then he disappears for a minute you could have nymphed through a spot when the fish just wasn't there or wasn't eating. And then your buddy could be fishing up behind you and the fish slides back out and he catches him and you go, Oh man, I've fished that really badly or something. And it's like, no, you didn't. He probably just wasn't there. He was under a rock or to the side. So I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn by like observing and watching fish and looking at dry fly fishing and then applying that stuff to nymph fishing as well. This is good stuff. I think, um, I think you could probably dig down. I mean, well, I guess one thing I want to note, you, you mentioned some YouTube videos, so we'll put links to some of those um, as far as the resources in, in the show notes. Um, you know, in, is that kind of the main place where, you know, somebody wanted to take this further, learn about your leaders and setups and things like that? Is, the, is that the best spot to go? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, have a look at YouTube. I try to do some, like, instructional leader setup videos there. And then most of the fishing videos there when I'm fishing, I'm literally just explaining how I'm fishing as I'm walking up. Um so there's a really good place because it should answer a lot of the basic questions if you're comprehending. Oh, people often go, how far do you generally like to cast when you're urine nymphing or this or that? You'll be able to see that. Um, you can also jump onto my Instagram, um, at Jarman Fishing, um, or my website, tomjarmanfishing.com, and get in touch with me there. You can shoot an email, send me a direct message, something like that. I'm always happy to answer those. I always say to people, don't be stressed if I don't get back to you straight away. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Uh, when I have yeah. time, so yeah, for, for sure. I, and I was just thinking, you know, the competition fishing is interesting. You know, it's always interesting to me uh, hearing a little more about that. Do you, I mean, can we dig into a little bit of that? I'm just curious. You know, like I said, Devin's talked about the process. You know, where is that at now with all this the, kind of the COVID stuff and traveling? Are you guys looking like you're gonna get back to that th- this this year sometime? Or yeah, how's yeah. That, all that been going? Yeah, it's it's really kind of weird at the moment. So we're at the moment the world championships are meant to be in Finland, in central Finland, in uh, in the start of August this year. Um, but here in Australia, when we're yeah, we have I think we have a travel ban. Um, anyway, we're not flying anywhere. So and I'm assuming the American team, the Canadians, you know, a lot of us who aren't in Europe are going to really struggle to get there. So um, whether it goes ahead is another thing because it did get postponed last year. Yeah, um, it was. so yeah it's really hard we've we've got domestic competitions running over here um because we're very fortunate in australia we've yeah pretty much barely having you know we're getting only a handful of cases a day um which is really good so i think we had one here in victoria where i'm from today and that was from um the grand slam tennis coming in so 
yeah, it's um, it's still running domestically here, but on an international level, it's going to be very interesting to see where it goes in, you know, the the next uh, the next little while. But yeah, I'm not <laughs> I'm not really sure actually. Yeah. Yeah. What What do you do with your time? You know, on when you're not doing you know the competition stuff. Uh, when you're not competing, you're normally thinking about your next competition and how you can <laughs> win it. Um, it's <laughs> It's all consuming. You know, it's, you brought up a really good point. And so uh, other than competition fishing, um, I guide over here in Australia. I write articles uh, for a few of the magazines and do some behind the scenes work like that. Um, but often when I'm not competing, I'm preparing for the upcoming comp. Even if it's two months away, it kind of narrows your focus a little bit. And I have some really good friends over here, um, Louis, that I fish with a lot. He's in some of my YouTube videos and he, he loves competition fishing and is quite serious about it, but he says he really enjoys it because it gives him focus and it gives him something to work on. And fly fishing is a never ending journey where you can just never, like there's always more to learn. So by having a competition, even when you're not competing, you think, oh, I've got a competition in two months on that river. The water's quite shallow. Um, I probably should practice some single nymph fishing. Um, the fish are quite small, so I should tie my flies on uh, some finer wire hooks, some dry fly hooks maybe, so they penetrate better because there's not the weight behind the fish. So you kind of – it gives you focus and it, it allows – gives you time to work on things and it just gives you fixed goals effectively. And ultimately, it's not how well you do in the comp, but it's the enjoyment of the preparation before the comp because your fly box starts looking really nice. You're, um, yeah, you're, you're fishing that type of water really well. And then you go, you fish that competition, then you go, oh, my next comp's a lake competition. And you go through the whole cycle again. So, yeah, it's quite, it's really fun like that. Yeah, I guess we haven't touched on on the lakes. Is that, I, I'm curious, you know, it's a whole other topic, but is that kind of a, you guys fish that equally or, or are you doing lakes and, and rivers in the same comps? Uh, we, we do a bit of a mix. Lake, um, lake fishing's pretty common over here in Australia. Um, I know it wasn't big at all when I was in, uh, when I was over in America doing, I did one lake clinic when I was in Oregon, and it just doesn't seem to be super popular or people don't know about it. But it's a huge part of the comp scene over here. It accounts for probably more than fifty percent of the competitions um, in Australia, um, and it's yeah, it's just a whole complete. It's just a completely different world of fishing. Um, it's just everything. The techniques are completely different. It's yeah, it's a whole other level. It's awesome. I was just going to say, it's interesting that you brought that up about like, you know, being over here in the States and seeming, it, it's seeming different and, you know, that like people weren't as interested in it. And that was going to be one of my questions for you is like, it isn't, you know, nearly what it is in other countries um, in the U S and I'm guessing that part of that has to do with the fact that we've got all this um, public water that people can fish on, you know, all these streams. But um is there, are there any like misconceptions or any advice that you would give people, you know, in the States who are thinking about getting into that, you know, into still water fishing? Um, and, and, you know, just what were, or a piece of advice you would give them or anything like that, you know, to kind of like, not necessarily draw people in, but you know, like what, what's, what's the, you know, what's great about it? Yeah. Well, um, that's such a good question. It's such a hard question. Um, yeah, I think you're spot on. You have so many good rivers over there. It would be like, why go to a lake to a degree? Um, but I think one of the, like lake fishing so good because part, I think part of the reason we all got into fly fishing is to learn and lake fishing is completely different. You can, you know, remove a lot of the, the gears different. That's a big part. We all love buying gear. Um, the gear is different for lake fishing. Um, the techniques are completely different. The dry fly fishing is different. It just all changes. I think one of the things I love about lake fishing, a lot of it's um, retrieval of the fly. And like on a river, you're, you're achieving a drift and you're trying to present, you know, 80% of the time we're trying to achieve a natural dead drift um, and the fish does the rest. Uh, lake fishing often, unless you're fishing static dries or static nymphs under a, uh, like under an indicator, which isn't something we do heaps of over here, um, you're generally retrieving the fly or giving the fly life. So I think you have a lot of control in, you know, how you get the eat. So 
if you're fishing a team of streamers on the lake, like small or small traditional English wet flies or a team of nymphs, like a team of chronomids, it's really good because you're controlling, the de- you're, you're choosing what depth you fish them at by the weight of the fly, um, your leader length, and also if you're using a floating line or various degrees of sinking lines. Um, so you're, you're making all the conscious decisions of this. And then beyond that, you've got to give the, you've got to present the fly. You've got to work out how they want it. What speed do they want it? Like, um, just what sort of presentation the, the fish actually want. And then going even further than that, the thing I love most about lake fishing like that is the take because you're fishing, you know, a lot of the time you're retrieving your flies when the fish eats it, it's like a strip strike or well, the fish is on essentially like you're not striking like you're the fish is eating a dry fly. So there's this amazing feeling and sensation when the fish eats it, you feel it in your hand. And it's like, you have a really cool connection to the fish. It's like, uh, like I grew up hand lining fish, like in salt water fishing, just like a spool of mono on the bottom with bait. And you actually feel the fish bite it in your hand. Um, that's the same sensation when you're lake fishing, cause you've got your rod pointed at the fish and you're retrieving or pulling your fly towards you and then the fish eats it and you've literally just got your left hand or your right hand on the line and you you tighten into the fish it's a really a really like people when they haven't done it and they do it they often say wow i love the take because it's so different it's just a completely different sensation to um yeah fishing a river and striking with the rod it's really cool it's like yeah it's like when you fish for a bone fish if you pull when you pull into a saltwater fish there's that really cool feeling in your hand um so i probably didn't answer your question very well at all then actually it answered for me it got me thinking too like i'm i love lake fishing too and i think for me you know like you said tom you know it's different you know it's different than river fishing i always i've always loved lake fishing for that reason that you're out there and the fish are bigger a lot of time not bigger always but i mean we just had an episode um dennis isbister was talking about pyramid lake which is has these monster 18 pound you know, uh, cutthroat trout, right? Lahat and cutthroat. And they're just gigantic. And so I think I've always experienced like, and there's obviously big river fi- uh, fish in the rivers as well, but it seems like I've caught some of my biggest trout, uh, you know, rainbows and stuff in lakes. So that's another thing, you know, is exciting for me, but definitely, I, I think it's going to get more popular too. I think as we go, I think it's more like the old school people, a lot of people understand lakes, but I think newer people getting into fly fishing don't know it as well. I think it'll grow. What do you think? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. I think people also find lakes daunting on a river. It's quite, they're a lot easier to read. Like you can see the current, you can, you know, it, you can pretty much look at the depth. You can look at the pockets, the depressions, the, the seams, and you can get a better read on it. Whereas when you turn up to a lake, you just think, where on earth do I start? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it's, right. it's daunting and it's big. So and like I always say, I give uh, talks at the fishing clubs over here. And when I talk about lake fishing, the first slide on every presentation is it doesn't matter where you start, just pick somewhere mm-hmm. because ultimately where you start is never where you finish. So don't stress about that. So if you're going to a lake, pick somewhere, look for food, look for rising fish, or just look for structure and start there and then just work through the process of fishing different water types. And it just eventuates and the day evolves. So I find that really mm-hmm. cool about the lake fishing, putting all the pieces of the puzzle together throughout the day. So, uh, are you, but I, yeah, I definitely think Dave, like it'll grow as people, more people get yeah. into it and more is published and written and, you know, filmed on it. Everyone will go, wow, that's really cool. Like you catch like really nice big fish and it just, it's something different. We're all looking for that different experience as well. Like we all travel overseas to, or travel to, fish for mm-hmm. bonefish or permit or trevally yep. and um yeah people don't travel up the mountain to fish a lake and i think people will start <laughs> to and go that's really different and really cool so yeah and now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors in today's world of mass-produced products stonefly nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. 
To be honest, I have never been a huge neck guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Okay, back to the show. Nice. Well, um, I feel like we're doing pretty good. I was kind of thinking about the lakes. I actually had uh, Jeff Perrin uh, was on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. We talked a little bit about... Um, we actually talked about lake fishing because we were we were talking. I'm trying to now, now I'm recollecting, but he mentioned the lock style stuff. Do you do you guys? I mean, can you explain that just briefly? What what that's all about? Kind of is that what you guys are doing when you're fishing lakes out there, or is that a totally different thing? Um, it's that's a it's really good. It's funny you say that because I had uh, I first met Jeff when I guided him on the Tasmanian lakes, and we did a bit of lock oh, wow. style fishing. Yeah. Um, and I think that was in 2017. That was a long time ago. I was 16. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. lock style fishing is a bit of a buzzword because um, ultimately a lock is lock is Scottish for lake, and it's so it's just lake style fishing. So it's just fishing a lake. <laughs> oh, okay. There you so go. That <laughs> there might you break go. it. Yeah, that might break it down for you. But um, yeah. traditional lock style fishing um, is typically you're fishing on a, a lake from a drifting boat. That's probably the defining factor. Yeah, so it's that's fishing. It. You're fishing from a drifting boat. Um, traditional lock style dry fish, fish, dry fly fishing done in Scotland, England, and Ireland um, is where you're fishing a team of three flies, typically, and um, like traditional traditional lock style fishing. You're fishing three traditional uh, wets or dries. You've got uh, the bob fly, which is called your top fly. Your middle fly is called your middle fly, and then the third third fly, which is on the end, is called your point fly. So if you ever hear someone talking about point fly, bob fly, middle fly, they're talking about lock style fishing typically from a lake. And um, you're pretty much casting them out. They hit the water. You're retrieving them, um, either pulling them across the top. And then at the end of the presentation, you've got um, at this time, you've got this technique effectively, which is called hanging the fly or dibbling the fly, which is where um, you literally lift your rod and you allow the wind to catch your line and swing the flies and they kind of dibble and glide across the top of the waves um or you've got a hang which is where you strip 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 lift your rod stop it and then let the flies hang and sit there and the fish often chasing them um eat on the hang because literally they're following the fly following the fly and then suddenly it stops and they swim over the top of it so um sorry that was a really bad description and a bit rambly <laughs> but um no <laughs> it's, it's typically you're fishing a team of three flies on a lake on a floating line um or now like on a sinking line um is very popular fishing a team of three streamers or uh three wet flies or you know three nymphs so yeah lock style fishing to keep it super super broad it's kind of like euro nymphing now no one knows exactly what it is it's a bit of a buzzword you could break lock style fishing down as fishing a team of flies on a lake from a drifting boat yeah That's gotcha it. from a super, dr- that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the drifting boat. And so when you guys are doing your comp, but you're, are you out there in boats or is this just, or how are you doing that? Yeah. So mainly from drifting boat. So, um, lock style fishing. Um, so you, you're fishing from a boat. There's two people in the boat. This is how it happens in the world championships. You fish downwind. So you're drifting with the wind, fishing downwind and you each are allowed to fish 90 degrees of the water. So you have the person at the front of the boat gets that quarter of the boat, that 90 degrees and likewise the other way um i should actually say it, someone if people from the uk are listening to this they will definitely comment or write in and go uh you when you talked about lock style fishing you forgot about the size of the fly and lock style competition um there is a difference between like f- competition fly fishing like myself devin olsen the american team do and lock style competition fishing lock style competition fishing is actually lake fishing competitions in uk and europe where the rule to define a lock style fly, I think it has to be under four centimeters long. So, cause that's traditionally what the flies were. They were small wets. So that's just in case someone does bring that up. Um, lock style competitions, uh, you know, small fly competitions on lakes essentially 
where the fly can only be a, a certain length. Yeah, I was I was kind of curious. I know that you know obviously you fished um, Colorado for the World Championships and you've been over to Oregon. Did you get did you find the fish over here um, receptive to the the same type of flies that you would use um, in your waters uh, where you are, or did you have to change tac- tactics drastically? You know, based on based on the lake, uh, or is, you know, in the, we're talking lake context or river context here. I have an answer. Uh, lake context. Um, lake context, pretty similar. You know, the, the one difference is the, the big difference globally um, in decision making when you're fishing flies on a lake is are your fish wild fish or are they stocked fish? Because that makes a massive, massive difference on the styles of flies you're fishing. Um, because so in on Sylvan Lake in Colorado, a lot of the rainbows were stocked. Um, I do believe so. Stock fish are far more inquisitive. They're put into this in strange environment, and the way for fish to sample, find out what food is to put it in, is to put it in their mouth. So they eat a wider range of louder, gaudier style flies or smaller flies. Um, a great example of blobs. I love an orange blob or a coral blob. Um, so yeah, that's one of one of the key differences. But I think. Um, I came, I, that was my first ever session in a world championships. I was in the boat with a Scottish guy on that lake and um, he won the session with 30 fish and I came third in the session with 19 um, and he caught them. Um, I only started catching them after I saw how he was fishing. He caught nine before I'd caught one and it was just fishing two flies on a type five sweep sinking line and there were two flies 10 foot apart and Point fly was a blank saver, which is a black woolly bugger style fly with a chartreuse speed. And I mean, in, if you go to fish in the UK, that's just like a viva, so is what they call it, um, is the color scheme of chartreuse in black. Um, in America, I think you guys call it a blank saver, um, but chartreuse in black. And then the top fly was just a chartreuse speeded olive damsel, which again, uh, with blue flash. So that's the blue flash damsel that they use in the UK on all their stock fish over there. So look, it's, it's so, and we, again, we use them over here in Australia. So it's totally universal. And I think to, to, I'm not sure if I'm jumping the gun to answer like the question about how the fish are, um, how they differ when you approach somewhere overseas. I think that's the same with rivers. It's, you know, what you use here is what they're going to eat over there. More often than not, it's all about the presentation, not the fly. Um, like I always say to people, make sure you have the presentation right because if the presentation's right, they'll eat it. You could have the world's best fly and the wrong presentation and it won't work. But if you have the right presentation and a marginal fly, it will. So that's actually better. So, yeah, focus on the presentation and getting it in front of them and finding the fish rather than the pattern. Nice. Well, I, I feel, I'm feel i feeling pretty good. What do you think, Zach? Do you have any other questions we want to throw out there before we start to wrap this up? Um, you know, I think the only other thing that I was, you know, I think this is a common question a lot of people have, and I don't even know if you necessarily have an answer for it, but does your internal clock for like, say you're, you're fishing a still water or a river, um, as far as pattern goes, like for when you make a change, was that, you know, like, like when do you make that decision? Like, of oh, I've, you know, I've gone to this fly, you know, I fished it through this section. Like, when do you know? Is, is it based on, like, okay, I got a good presentation in that spot. They didn't eat it. And I know I should have gotten an eat there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how, how does your internal clock work for that? Like, yeah. knowing when to that, make that change. Yeah. So that there's a two-part answer to that, I think. Um, and one of them is confidence. It's all about confidence. As soon as you lose confidence in a flight, you've got to change. Um, that's a part of it. But secondly, and this is a hard one for people getting into it because it takes time to develop. You need, you almost need to have a gauge, um, need to uh, manage your expectation, and you almost need to have a target in your head of, look, that's a real. If you if you're catching plenty of fish on a river, or say you're going to a river and you know that you can catch a, you know, X number of fish on this river, um, and you come up and you fish through a hundred meters, say. And you haven't caught a fish and you go, well, I probably should have caught a fish by now. That's, I mean, a very, that's an overly simplistic way of going, yeah, it's time to change. Um, often I, the way I do it is 
Um, I talk a lot about the drift, but typically when you're fishing a river, you're looking for a certain drift. Like you're fishing through your water. Let's say you have a boulder and you have a nice seam and a pocket behind it. As soon as you think you've made the right drift through there with a fly pattern um, and you haven't gotten the eat, that would be when I go, well, there has to be a fish there. I'm going to change to catch him. Um, so it, I think it, it all depends on, you know, your expectation. A, a good example, and it's a lake example, but um, let's say – um, if like, and this is a competition example that can be drawn across to just social fishing anywhere. Is that if you're fishing on a, on a lake competition, the sessions go for. We use Sylvan Lake as an example from the worlds. If you're fishing on the lake and it's a three-hour session, and you know that you need to catch, uh, let's make it a round number so it works. Uh, let's say you need to catch nine fish to win the session, and you're aiming to win the session. If you you pretty much need to be catching one fish every 20 minutes at that rate. And if you're an hour in and you haven't caught a fish and you thought, look, I need to have nine by the end of the three hours, you really should be changing. So I think a lot of the time you have in your head how many you expect to catch or would be happy catching under the given conditions and then fish to that um, and go, look, I've been going for 20 minutes. I really need to have, should have caught one by now would have hoped to i'm going to change um and you also and that also goes for if you're fishing in in winter or you're fishing in really cold hard conditions and you only need to catch one fish to make it a good day i probably wouldn't change fly at all change pattern at all because you know you only need one fish so any time you spend changing is time you're not fishing so it all it becomes a percentages game um so you're going you're going, look, I just need to catch one fish. I'm looking for that one active, one aggressive fish. And how often do we, when it's a tough day of fishing, we're fishing and we're fishing and we're fishing, and then you finally catch one and you go, God, like he would have eaten anything. <laughs> he was so keen. <laughs> um, right. That's often what it's like, I think. So you don't need to stress it. Like, yeah, so I think if it's just about managing, yeah, the conditions and looking around thinking, look, I if my aim today is to catch you know, two fish and I'm fishing all day, you just really want to spend, keep your fly in the water. Don't change too much. Keep working, keep working. Um, but if you have the most amazing mayfly hatch and there are fish rising everywhere and you're not catching them, that's probably a time when you go, look, I probably should be catching quite a few fish here. I'm going to change my fly. So you need to be able to use that example of the, um, the mayfly hatch and them all feeding all around you and you not catching them you need to be able to think like that when the fishing should be good and there are no fish rising because they're eating nymphs or something. Yeah, it's, so it's, again, that's a hard, long-winded, awkward answer. Um, but there is no answer. It's it's a confidence thing and it's a feel thing, which comes with time. It makes sense to me. I mean, I think that the, everybody's got their own little their own little method, and it depends on the situation. I know. Well, I was going to note before we, we get out of here, uh, Devin Olson, if anybody wants to know how the Euro nymphing thing works, he explained some of the details on how the scoring and stuff, because I didn't understand any of that either. And so I'll put links to that in the show notes. And and yeah, I mean, this is this has been a lot of fun. I think, um, I don't know, I think definitely <laughs> I've never been over to Australia. That's the one thing we didn't dig into here. We've got some listeners in that area. And I, I'm I'm going to be excited when I get over there eventually. You know what I mean? Do you guys... W- what is it like? I mean, obviously it's different. Um, what is your home? Do you give us, what's your home river over there that you fish mostly? Uh, home river. So I'm based, I'm currently based in like the Melbourne area. Um, my home water would be the Goulburn Valley, uh, which is about an hour and a half from Melbourne. Um, so the Stevenson river and Rubicon river, uh, two of my absolute favorites. They're fantastic, small to medium sized freestone rivers, uh, with brown and rainbow trout. And that is, yeah, there you go. That's the spot. It's everyone will know it. Anyone in Australia would know those rivers. They'll go, oh yeah, that's, probably my, that's my All home right. river too. <laughs> well, well, let's go. Let's do a circle before we get out of here. As far as the um, you know bucket list, so uh, what's your top? What, what do you got on your? You got a spot. I mean, you've obviously probably traveled a lot of places. Anything left still to do? Uh, bucket list. That's a really good one. You know, it's uh, oh, that's really hard. I, I actually have <laughs> – my bucket list almost includes going back to two places, I think. Right. Okay. Because um, the, the question I often get is where are the two best places you fish? Um, yeah. And the, so of all the places like continental Europe, um, mm-hmm. Poland, 
I'd definitely go back to Poland in a heartbeat to fish the Sand River for grayling and trout with dry flies, big, long, wide, shallow, flat river. But I think Japan is number one, the next place I want to go. Um, oh, to wow. fish for more Yamame and uh, Yuana, like the char. So I got to do that in 2017, I think. And that is mind-blowing for your fishing ability and the scenery, snow monkeys in the river, um, thermal hot spring. Like you can fish it when uh, the region I went, there's um, the rivers like there's snow everywhere, but the river's warm because of all the thermal hot springs entering it. And you have like crazy. snow monkeys bathing, bathing in the river and you've got deer and bears and <laughs> it's really nice. cool. And the fish are eating, the fish are eating yellow mayfly <laughs> so in cool. the middle in, when it's snowing. So that's amazing. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is uh, back to Africa to catch tiger fish again. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. If anyone hasn't done that or thought about it, it's like fishing for trout. Crazy. That's um, fishing for trout on steroids. They're amazing. They're so trouty like um, the tiger fish. So, yeah, they're very, very, very cool. Well, uh, I don't think we've had an episode yet on that, so maybe we'll save that for another one if we get you back on. What about you, Zach? What, what do you got? What's on your bucket list? Oh, man, my bucket list just seems lame at this point now after those stories. <laughs> well, I can't, you, uh, give us one. Give us one. Uh, I've, I've got, you know, so many rivers left on my uh, kind of Montana exploration. I've been slowly moving myself that direction. Every year I get a few trips out there. Um, and so I've just kind of been checking off, you know, different rivers off the list. Um, but, uh, I don't want to hotspot any places, but yeah, yeah, yeah there's quite a few rivers out there. Yeah, that still, that's cool. I still want to spend a lot more time on, and, and there's a few, uh, cutthroat streams in Yellowstone that I'd really love to get some time on some yeah. camping. And, that should have been know, mine. Be out there. Ah, yellow, I forgot Yellowstone. <laughs> that is, that actually probably is it. Cause I haven't been there. Sorry. Oh, there you go. I'll steal that one off you. I'll take Yellowstone. There you okay. go. See, see, you had the better ones. Well, mine would be. I'm throwing out um, a tarpon. Is my, is my oh, species. Nice. But I guess, I guess, yeah, maybe South America or something is. Kind like of Cuba. To, uh, you know, I don't know exactly. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Costa Rica. I don't. I don't know. I guess it doesn't really matter. I don't know it that well. I just want to catch. I, I, I've interviewed a few people and I've asked them like, what is their. Um, Jim Teeny, I remember way back and on the wet fly swing, and he said uh, he's fished everything. He was like tarpon by far is his number one species, uh, um, but I've never never done it. How about you, uh, Tom? Have you fished for tarpon? I uh, only Australian tarpon, which is a different species to Megalops atlanticus, which is the tarpon you guys have. So there are tarpon are a lot smaller. Um, oh yeah. So, mm-hmm. Like how, what's smaller? Like like a ten uh, pounder. Uh, not even like a six, seven pounder is a giant is a really good one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but no, I haven't done, um, yeah, I haven't done tarpon. So I reckon, yeah, Cuba or Florida tarpon would be yeah, amazing. Yeah, or Florida, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I did have a tarpon. Yeah. Bruce, um, Bruce Char- uh, Sh- uh, Chard was on. He, he talked about a uh, giant. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I think the, the giant tarpon seems almost like, I don't know if it sounds as much fun as catching more of the 50 pounder, you know? What yeah. I, mean? I think the mangroves, like the mangroves and the, yeah. yeah. Like the medium sized ones sound really cool. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, I think we're good here. Uh, I mean, Tommy, I know we didn't, there's always stuff we leave on the table. Um, do, do you feel that we touched on a few things? I, I love that four, you know, you, you, those four things you were talking about there that, that helped help me out. But, uh, and Zach, are you feeling that you, did you learn something today? Oh yeah. Always. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think that's about it. If they, uh, if anybody wants to find you, Tom, um, it was uh, TomJarmanFishing.com, uh, right? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I'll put links out to that in the show notes. And um, yeah, this is this has been a lot of fun. We're we're definitely the co-hosting thing. I think is um, you know it's uh, definitely it can be a little bit challenger challenging, you know, as as opposed to the the solo sh- thing. But it's more. It's a kind of more entertaining, more fun because you know what I mean? It's not just my boring voice asking <laughs> questions and you got, you know what I mean? You got somebody else asking, yeah. asking questions. I, I think it, uh, it's been fun for me. So I hope you guys enjoy it and I'll, and I'll, uh, connect with you when we, uh, we get this thing out there. Sounds awesome. That was great. Yeah, that was super fun. Thanks, Tom. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Zach. That was, um, yeah, that was brilliant. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, uh, all the links and everything else we talked about, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 212, 212. 
If you can, uh, please leave a review. I haven't mentioned the review for a while, but it uh, definitely helps, especially if you're on an app that maybe we haven't uh, had a lot of reviews on. So go down your app and take a look and see. And if you can, just click, click a click review, uh, a star, um, whatever you think. That would be amazing. And uh, and check us and send a message out on uh, social, a DM with a double lightning bolt. I haven't used that uh, in a while. If you could add the mic in there, double lightning bolt with a mic, that'd be cool. I oh, just want to give one shout out. Uh, next week, uh, we have uh, Charles Jardine, uh, the lefty Cray of the UK. Basically, this guy is, knows his stuff. So if you haven't heard of Charles before, he's going to be here to bring uh, to bring the good stuff. So check that out. And, uh, and again, stay with us uh, next week. That's pretty much a wrap. That's all I have for you today. Uh, I want to thank you again and hope to maybe catch up with you soon. Maybe see you online or maybe on a trip we've got coming up on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.